is my pleasure to say welcome to public lectures and concerts uh, at the American Philosophical Society. Uh, we have missed these occasions and are delighted to have you here with us, socially distanced and fully vaccinated. Reflecting on the spirit of inquiry of our founder, Benjamin Franklin, the APS is a preparatory, uh, participatory organization governed by its highly distinguished members for the continuing purpose of promoting useful knowledge. We advance this mission with the engagement of leading scholars, scientists, and professionals through election to membership and opportunities for interdisciplinary intellectual fellowship, particularly at our semi-annual meetings and evenings such as this. We serve scholars through an internationally recognized research library, archiving manuscripts and other collections of enduring historic value. We support wide-ranging research and discovery through grants and fellowships, publications, prizes, and public exhibitions. Our home, since our founding in 1743, is located in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people. We at the APS recognize their continued presence and honor their community and those of other Native peoples, especially through the working partnerships of our Center for Native American and Indigenous Research. For more about the APS, I urge you to check out our website, which is www.amphilsoc.org, A-M-P-H-I-L-S-O-C.org, both for new and for archived off offerings. We are delighted to have with us the Raritan Players for a concert of 18th century music, almost all of which was composed by Ignatius Sancho, a black British writer, Sancho is known today primarily as the author of an extensive correspondence, published posthumously, which was intended to criticize and disrupt the African slave trade. Yet he was also the first black man to publish his original musical compositions, some five volumes of them, in this, uh, from some five volumes of them. In this concert with commentary performed on period instruments, these gorgeous instruments here on the stage, the Raritan players will show how Sanchez drew on the musical tropes of polite society to awaken the British public to the evils of discrimination and slavery. The leader of the Raritan players is musicologist and historical keyboardist Rebecca Cypress, Cypest. Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Associate Professor of Music at the Mason Gross School of Arts, Rutgers University. A specialist in the history, performance, practices, and meanings of music in the 17th and 18th century, Professor Sipis founded the Raritan Players in order to explore little-known performance practices and repertoire of the 17th and 18th century. Among Professor Sipis' accomplishments, many of you will recall a wonderful performance she gave here at the APS several years ago that contributed to the player's recording in the Salon of Madel Brion. So please take a look at the close, uh, closer look at the program for more information about Professor Sipis and the other talented members of the Raritan Players. Also, please silence your cell phones, and I will restore my mask to its proper not standing at the podium position and I say, let the music begin. Thank you all. Good evening. Yes, yeah, so well, we're actually not going to start with music. We're going to talk a little bit before we begin. Ignatius Sancho was an 18th century black man of letters and the first black man to publish his musical compositions. Enslaved from birth, he became an independent shopkeeper, a writer and musical composer whose interest in the arts of theater, dance, painting, and literature is attested both in contemporaneous accounts and in his correspondence, most of which was assembled, edited, and published posthumously in 1782 as the letters of the late Ignatius Sancho, an African. While some details of Sancho's life are not securely known, his correspondence reveals his erudition, his command of literature and philosophy, and his attention to the evils of slavery 
and the dehumanization of blacks at the hands of the British Empire, from the West Indies to the streets of London. In 1766, having read a passage in British novelist Lawrence Stern's Sermons of Mr. York that decried the slave trade as a poison, Sancho implored Stern to give half an hour's attention to slavery in the next installment of his novel, Tristram Shandy. In doing so, Sancho argued, Stern would perhaps ease the yoke of his miserable black brethren by touching and amending the hearts of Stern's readers. The need could not have been more urgent. By the end of the 18th century, Britain had become the leading slave trading nation in the world, with British traders violently capturing and enslaving an average of 42,000 African people annually, roughly triple the number from before 1720, and yielding profits for large segments of the British population. Sancho's letter to Stern, a resolute protest of slavery, asserted that the arts could awaken the empathy of white Britons for black Africans and for the cause of abolition and emancipation. The exchange with Stern was published after Stern's death in 1775 and subsequently viewed as a model of sentimental writing. Sancho's correspondence has been examined in the past and noted for its anti-slavery stance before the British abolitionist movement became widespread. By contrast, Sancho's musical compositions one book of songs, and four volumes of instrumental dance pieces published between approximately 1767 and 1779 have thus far eluded attempts at serious interpretation. While modern writers have noted their significance as apparently the first publications of original compositions by a black man, musicologists have repeatedly called Sancho's music simple and noted its suitability for amateurs. A simple approach can surely be discerned in his melodic and harmonic language, and in the short forms and regular phrase structures that he employs, and was common with all dance mu popular dance music of the time. But such a characterization belies the complex meaning of his music, and it discourages and deflects attempts to engage with his music more deeply. In fact, such a deeper interpretation of Sancho's music is crucial to understanding his cultural agenda, since it was the music books that Sancho prepared for publication himself, not, by and large, the correspondence, which was assembled, edited, and published by others. We have constructed the performance this evening around Sancho's six songs, and we've embedded each of these within a suite of his instrumental music. These instrumental pieces are miniatures, some charming, some passionate, some celebratory, and some full of pathos, which represent a wide range of human emotions. Understood in the context of his poetic choices and his letters, Sancho's music attests to his understanding of the arts as vehicles of black resistance.
Ignatius Sancho simultaneously brushed shoulders with the elite of white British society and was marginalized and othered by them. His tenuous place in society may be reflected in his song, in the text of his song, The Complaint, which we just heard. The text is from Shakespeare's Measure for Measure. In Shakespeare's play, the text, the text projects the emotions of Mariana, a woman who has been betrayed in love by Angelo, yet remains drawn to him nevertheless. First with the words, take, oh, take those lips away, and then, but my kisses bring again, the song projects Mariana's ambivalence, her bitterness at her rejection, yet her desire for Angelo's companionship. Sancho's choice of this text to open his collection of new songs seems purposeful. Through it, he too adopts Mariana's ambivalent position. Sancho projects his own authorial voice as one on the margin of society, looking on from a distance and with a critical irony. That the collection of new songs was published anonymously, as shown here, with the composer identified only as an African, amplifies the effect of this marginal positioning, rendering it in the voice of any of the tens of thousands of blacks who called Britain their home. The next piece in Sancho's collection of new songs is Sweetest Bard. Addressed to Shakespeare, the poem celebrates the bard's ability to unite all of humanity, and it calls upon each muse and sister grace, sorry, to pay homage to the bard on the banks of the Avon River. As Sancho's publication indicates, this poem was drawn from Mr. Garrick's Ode, that is, the actor David Garrick's Ode upon dedicating a building and erecting a statue to Shakespeare, which Garrick created for the Shakespeare Jubilee at Stratford-upon-Avon in 1769, and which was set to music by Thomas Arne. Yet the text had a longer history, one with significant implications for understanding Sancho's setting. Garrick had used an earlier version of this poem in a, re in a revival of Harlequin's Invasion, a pantomime with music by William Boyce, in which the comic character Harlequin stages an assault on Parnassus, the domain of Shakespeare, and is soundly beaten and expelled. 
Sancho knew Garrick socially and was enthusiastic about the theater. Thus, in Sweetest Bard, it might seem that Sancho was simply adding his voice to the chorus who sought to celebrate Shakespeare as a unifying cultural symbol and whose presence had begun to permeate the expanding British Empire. Yet Sancho may also have felt some affinity for the rejected Harlequin. Recognizable by his characteristic black mask, the stock figure of Harlequin, the servant of the Commedia dell'arte, had become associated with black Africans. Indeed, Harlequin's Invasion was the first play to make the association between the black masked Harlequin and black Africans explicit, with Garrick referring to Harlequin as a blackamoor. For Sancho, a black composer, to assume the voice of the muses and graces in crowning Shakespeare with his laurel wreath was thus to upend the message of Harlequin's invasion. Far from allowing Harlequin to be expelled from the realm of Shakespeare, the song asserts Harlequin's continued presence in Shakespeare's pastoral world. Sancho reverses Harlequin's defeat and insists that this black figure assume his rightful place in British culture and society. In the performances that follow, you'll hear Arne's setting juxtaposed with Sancho's, that is their settings of Sweetest Bard. Arne adopted some woodland sounds, which you'll hear um, in the form of the, the flute imitating bird song. Um, but he also incorporated tropes of military music to assert Britain's supremacy. So on the words Britain's glory, which you'll hear, he uses the sound of military trumpets in the form of um, a unison or octave triads. Um, Sancho, by contrast, composed Sweetest Bard as a sprightly jig. Sancho's setting thus diffuses Arne's militaristic assertions of Britain's supremacy and restores the poem and Shakespeare to a pastoral context. Thank you. 
The works of the ancient Greek poet Anacreon rose to popularity among the British elite for their sentimentalism and their antique, seemingly natural style. Yet Sancho may have felt, again, a special affinity for Anacreon. Anacreon's 18th century translator, Francis Fox, reported that Anacreon's people had almost lost their freedom when they came under assault from outside invaders, and the poet was forced into exile. While the work of Anacreon was celebrated by the British public, that public apparently failed to notice the parallels between the tragic story of the poet and that of the black Africans whom the British themselves attacked and subjected to slavery. Even more revealing is Sancho's particular choice of Anacreon's Ode 23, which points out the futility of accumulating riches in this world. The poet resolves instead to enjoy life's true pleasures, especially by cultivating friendship and beauty. Fox elucidated this poem with an anecdote. Anacreon, having received a present of five talents of gold from Polycrates, ty tyrant of Samos, was so embarrassed with the cares and solicitudes about his treasure that he could not sleep for two nights successively, whereupon he sent back the present with this apology to his patron that however valuable the sum might be, it was not a sufficient price for the trouble and anxiety of keeping it. While the connection of this, between this poem and Sancho's position on slavery may not be immediately clear, an excerpt from Sancho's correspondence sheds light on its possible meaning. Writing to Jack Wingrave, a young military man stationed in India, Sancho registered one of his few overt criticisms of the institution of slavery cautioning Wingrave not to judge the natives of India too harshly because they had learned their worst deceits from the white Christian slave traders. Sancho wrote, I am sorry to observe that the practice of your country, that is your country, which as a resident I love and for its freedom and the many blessings I enjoy in it shall ever have my warmest wishes, prayers, and blessings. I say it is with reluctance that I must observe your country's conduct has been uniformly wicked in the East, West Indies. And even on the coast of Guinea, the grand object of English navigators, indeed of all Christian navigators, is money, money, money. 
Although Sancho's collection of new songs includes Anacreon's poem without explanation or comment, and thus without mention of Fox's anecdote, it seems likely that Sancho consciously chose this poem as a means of deftly, yet pointedly criticizing the musicians, readers, and listeners who would use his book.
Sancho's adoption of the persona of Harlequin in Sweetest Bard is what, but one example in which he purposefully assumes the voice of the wise fool. Recognizing that many white Britons viewed black people as temperamentally and even biologically incapable of intellectual acumen, Sancho cast himself as a wise fool, a prophetic figure, well known in literature from characters including Shakespeare's Falstaff, Stern's Yorick, and Cervantes' Sancho Panza, for whom Ignatius Sancho was reportedly named. Sancho criticized British society from these seemingly lowly and marginal positions, and he used them to point out the foolishness of society as a whole. The basis of this figure in Christian theology and morality is made clear in 1 Corinthians, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Sancho's adoption of the voice of the wise fool helps to explain his keyboard composition, Mungo's Delight. The figure of Mungo originated in the 1768 comic opera, The Padlock, with text by Isaac D Bickerstaff and music by the ever enterprising Charles Dibden. The slave Mungo speaks and sings in this opera in a stereotyped dialect that inspired laughter and derision in thousands of performances across Britain and in theaters from Kingston to Calcutta. The term Mungo soon came to refer to all blacks. In the padlock, Mungo longs to learn music since in Bickerstaff's words, it will cure him of thinking. Dibden's music for Mungo's songs is purposefully simplistic. In Dear Heart, What a Terrible Life I Am Led, the vocal part takes the form of a patter song with the rapid repetition of notes used to demonstrate Mungo's lack of musical refinement. In addition, the downward stepwise, stepwise motion on the words Dear Heart are echoed in an octave, an octave down in the instruments, giving the overall melody a sense of angularity and disjointedness. Dibden may have intended this angularity to reflect the physical comedy of Mungo's presence on the stage, a feature that can be seen in the widely circulated engravings of Dibden in the black face character of Mungo. Oops, sorry. Sancho's Mungo's Delight echoes musical elements of Dibden's settings with angular leaps in the melodic line that mirror the awkwardness of Dear Heart. The keyboardist must leap up and down, landing accurately and deftly. Thus, Sancho seems to accept and reappropriate or reinterpret the figure of Mungo, changing him from a source of comedy and derision into one with impressive agility and musicianship. While the referent of Mungo's delight is unclear, it's plausible that Sancho was using the, the title to refer to himself as a real yet subversive incarnation of the fictional figure. While Dibden's Mungo is a laughable character, Sancho turns him into a version of the wise fool who uses his musical skill to comment on the injustice of Dibden's portrayal.
A significant point about Sancho's music is his inclusion of French horns in some of the instrumental dance pieces, as you've been hearing. This was highly unusual in 18th century chamber music. While sometimes notated in orchestral pieces, horn parts were rarely included in compositions for small ensembles such as this. Why then might Sancho have chosen to use horns? In featuring these instruments, I think, Sancho makes visible on the printed page what would in most otherwise situations have, have only been audible, the presence of black musicians. There is ample evidence linking enslaved blacks and black servants in 18th century Britain with the French horn. Here's one example, a portrait of the black servant John Hanby with a horn. This print, titled High Life Below Stairs, or Mungo, Addressing My Lady's Maid, and note the, worst of the use of the word Mungo there, caricatures black servants' identification with the horn. This identification is evident, too, from some of the many advertisements demanding the return of runaway slaves. Consider, for example, a 1768 advertisement seeking the return of John Chalk, who plays upon the French horn and violin. A black man named Prince could be recognized by the fact that he speaks pretty good English and blows the French horn tolerably well. The cruelty to which these men were subjected is alluded to in the advertisement seeking the capture of William Souza, a Negro boy about 17 years of age, short and stout made, marked on one or both of his temples with scars and also on the forehead, blows the French horn and plays a little on the German flute. These and many other examples attest to black slaves and servants learning to play the horn, presumably using the instrument in ceremonial situations or to accompany social dancing. That social dancing sometimes took place in black-only environments is clear from a report in the London Chronicle of 1764. Among the sundry and fashionable routes or clubs that are held in town, that of the blacks or Negro servants is not the least. On Wednesday last, no less than 57 of them, men and women, supped, drank, and entertained themselves with dancing and music, consisting of violins, French horns, and other instruments at a public house in Fleet, in Fleet Street till four in the morning. No whites were allowed to be present for all the performers were black. In most situations, this would not necessarily have been where Sancho's music would have been used, right? He would have used his music for his white, first, the, the people who enslaved him would have demanded that he learn to play music. 
Um, and then he actually returned to, to serve them as a, as a paid employee later in life. Um, and in that context, it was, it was during that period that he published most of his music. Um, so he would have used the music in that context as well to accompany social dancing among the white British elite. But it is certainly plausible that some of his music would have been used in situations like the one described here, and also that other black musicians would simply have improvised music using violins, using French horns, and other instruments like these um, in environments like the one described here. In the set of music that we'll play now, you'll hear two minuets alongside two settings of the poem Kate of Aberdeen, one in a tune that was well known and another in which Sancho again subverted expectations by composing a new tune for a familiar poem. So you can see on the left is Kate of Aberdeen, Kate of Aberdeen a favorite Scotch song um, in an arrangement by a composer, Jonathan Battishill. And on the right is Sancho's recomposition of this. So again, he's, he's sort of inserting his own authorial voice um, to sort of subvert expectations. Thank you. 
the opening of this lecture, we mentioned the letter that Sancho wrote to Lawrence Stern in which he implored Stern to give half an hour's attention to slavery in Tristram Shandy. As stated earlier, Sancho believed that Stern's literature could be a vehicle for social and political change, increasing anti-slavery sentiments in his readers. Stern replied that coincidentally, he had just finished writing a tender tale involving a young black servant girl and he would see about including it in the novel's next installment. Sancho must have been pleased when that tender tale appeared in the final installment of Tristram Shandy, fulfilling Sancho's written request for the novel to address the subject of slavery. In this tale, the two characters, Toby and Trim, find a young black girl in a store swatting at flies with a feather because she did not want to kill them. The character Toby remarks, "'Tis a pretty picture. She had suffered persecu persecution, Trim, and had learnt mercy." Trim and Toby then wonder together whether black people have souls. I am not much verse, corporal, quoth my uncle Toby, in things of that kind, but I suppose God would not leave him without one any more than thee or me. The longer narrative goes on to make other important points on the theology and politics of slavery in what Brian Carey describes as a sentimental parable, a manifestation of 18th century sensibility which emphasized feelings over intellect yielding a moral lesson. And while in today's context, we might consider it naive to think that art can advance morality, some of the leading thinkers of 18th century Europe, such as Rousseau and Goethe, explored the connection between feeling and moral development. Sancho's letter to Stern, published in 1775, an impassioned proposal of the role of the arts in anti-slavery thought is of a piece with the many other Enlightenment era texts that saw the arts as a means to advance morality. While Sancho's letters have been studied in the past, we hope we have shown that his music, long neglected, is equally rich and complex and also warrants attention. We know from his letter to Stern that Sancho believed in pursuing social and political aims through artistic expression. So to find social and politi political aims in his music should be no surprise. His body of musical work is replete with allusions, and he draws from texts from the ancient Greeks to Shakespeare. These aspects of his work bring to mind the words of W.E.B. Du Bois in The Souls of Black Folk. I sit with Shakespeare, and he winces not. Across the color line, I move arm in arm with Balzac and Dumas, where smiling men and welcoming women glide in gilded halls. From out the caves of evening that swing between the strong-limbed earth and the tracery of the stars, I summon Aristotle and Aurelius and what soul I will, and they come, all, graciously, with no scorn nor condescension. So, wed with truth, I dwell above the veil. Those are the words of W.E.B. Du Bois. Like Sancho, Du Bois brought himself directly into relation with a European cultural tradition across centuries. In doing so, he not only asserted his presence in this tradition, but he also engaged in a dialogue that raises important moral questions for his white audience. Du Bois continues, in this, is this the life you grudge us, O knightly America? Is this the life you long to change into the dull red hideousness of Georgia? Are you so afraid, lest peering from this high pisgah between Philistine and Amalekite, we sight the promised land? While Sancho's music does not accommodate such direct questions, his music, through the texts of his songs and or the titles of his compositions are invitations to his players and listeners to make sense of the relationship between those texts and titles and him as a black person creating art. In our final set of this program, in between the minuets, you'll hear two selections, Sancho's Cotillion Shandy Hall 
and Friendship's Source of Joy from his collection of new songs, a song whose text is anonymously identified only as a lady. While the text on the surface is about rejecting romantic love for platonic love, the line in verse 1, we hug our chain, evokes bondage. And knowing this music has been set by a black composer, the text takes on additional meaning. In his life, and even after his death, Sancho had a circle of elite friends, patrons, and customers that helped him and supported him. Through his work for the Montague family, his annuity from the Duchess after her death, and his business as a grocer, he became independent and supported his wife and children. Friendship was essential to his survival, and it sustained his family even after his death. The title of the cotillion Shandy Hall is a nod to Lawrence Stern's novel Tristram Shandy. It is the place Stern completed the novel, and not just any novel, but the one in which Sancho himself played a role in shaping by that letter we mentioned earlier. Dancers, players, listeners in the 18th century would certainly have been aware of this connection which in turn provided an opportunity for people to shift their view of him from a black man at the margins of culture and society to one who played a central and important role.
with us, whatever, I, whatever is best. Jessica, do you want to? If anyone has questions, we can. Uh, if you're on your way out, don't yeah. feel obliged. Yeah, go ahead. There, There's uh, CDs for sale in the back if you want one. Oh, you have a question? Yeah. So my one question is, this is an odd ensemble. It is. Did yeah. other people write this kind of an ensemble? So I'm going to have to throw that question to our horn players. I'm not aware of other chamber music from 18th century London, certainly, that included horns. Linda or Elizabeth, are you aware of any of that? Yeah, so no, <laughs> right? The, so these, these instruments were written for commonly, right? Flute, violin, keyboard, continuo, but the, the use of horns was quite distinctive and that's what made us wonder about, you know, the possible connection to the practice of having black musicians specifically learn to play the horn, so, sure. One, one sec, Alia, hold on. I wonder if um, Ignatius played an instrument himself or how he learned to write for such an ensemble. Right. So he actually never tells us what instrument he plays. As far as I know, there's no evidence of that in the letters, and I don't know of any other documents that explain specifically what instruments he played. Um, I was hearing before how the horn parts are pretty idiomatic, like maybe he really knew that instrument well, but he probably also knew how to play keyboard instruments and it wouldn't surprise me if he knew violin at least as well. Um, he seems to have been a fairly versatile musician um, and that's part of the broader education that he received um, when he was... Um, brought into the house, still as a slave, but brought into the house of Lord Montague, the, right, the Duke of, the first Duke of Montague, who was, who sort of fancied himself a patron of black intellectuals or, you know, sort of uh, someone who would uplift black people and grant them an education, he gained access to all of the Montague family's books and their whole social circle. It was a very musical family, so he was probably trained as part of his education in that circle. So uh, the instrumentation is specified in the score or uh, it's not just, it's not something that you arranged or is it a mix of uh, arrangement for those instruments and, or, and specified in score. I mean, I know that some of it was written specifically for horns, but I'm wondering how right. much of so, it. So for the most part, the horn parts are, the horn parts are specified, right? Those are special and those can't really be transferred to other instruments. Um, the air that you heard at the end in the last set does specify violin and German flute, right? Which is that, that kind of flute that Steve is playing. Um, many of the other pieces are just for keyboard and we've arranged them for this ensemble, but again, I think that that was fairly common. Anybody else wanna throw anything in here? Okay. Hi, uh, Ms. Cypress, you sang just beautifully, oh. and I was wondering if This those... is Sonia Headlam, she's the singer, Sonia Headlam. Oh, I'm Yay. sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sonia, you sang, you sang very beautifully. And I was wondering if those songs were uh, specifically designated for soprano, or could any voice those they were? They were written for soprano. Uh huh. They, um, you know, they fit a high that a so, I mean, I think a tenor could also manage them, but they're they're for high voice. Okay. Oh, very nice. Thank and you. Some of them in the original key. Yeah. I noted that the cello part on the the, uh, the shandy and on the last piece uh, had a had a had some had some uh, instrumentation that sounded like the uh, the, the drone of bagpipes. Uh, is there any uh, actual connection there? Would he have heard? Would uh, would the composer have heard bagpipes or something? That's, it was kind of an improvised idea on our part, but definitely fitting with the tradition of that music, I think, yes, yeah. So that's what we were trying to elicit, like convey was the drone of the bagpipes, yeah.